been an interesting week. Uh, for those who live in Southern California, right? Uh, the West Lines. How many have watched that? And you see there's a uh, Prius that was bobsledding down the road. I mean, and I'm just going, there's two people inside. Uh, kind of really brought home to me some of the things that I, when I went to Biloxi many years ago, the, the, just the devastation. And people come back to that devastation, uh, they're pretty much in shell shock. They, they just stand there and they're just like, what do they do? You know, where, where do they even begin? And uh, as I was looking at just some of the, the things that were going on up there, I realized that uh, a lot of these people are facing the same thing. It's not an easy feeling. It's not an easy feeling to be facing the fact that you have just lost everything. And now you're coming back to maybe just the foundation. If that. If that. And uh, I, in, uh, a couple of weeks ago, when Pastor Freddie, well, a couple, actually a couple of months ago, when Pastor Freddie started the, uh, the Acts, he had this, um, uh, just the, the beginning of it, he was talking about the apostles and how they had, the disciples really at that point, had, had come back and they're, they're going to Jerusalem where Jesus told them to go. I'm thinking they're, they're feeling this complete sense of loss. You know, what are, who are we now? What are we here for? How are we, how are we gonna? How are we going forward? What do we do? And they asked Jesus this question: Are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? That was their question in Acts, right? Acts chapter one. And what Jesus' response was: Anybody know? Not at this time. It's not for you to know. Well, it's actually, it's not the first time that the Jews had faced this kind of a crisis. It's really just for the disciples at this point. So what I want to do is I want to take a look at the promise of the kingdom of God. Now, I'm not going to be able to do what uh, John did here a couple of weeks ago for those who were here. He did an excellent job on it. But I want to take a look in the Old Testament at that promise. I'm going to take a look at that promise. Now, we're going to be essentially going from 1 Chronicles, actually we're going to go back all the way to Genesis. And we're going to look at that promise, but we're specifically going to be looking at Chronicles and connecting Chronicles to Acts. Chapter 1, verses 6 and 7. Right? And in so doing, I think what we're going to see is how we have a, a God who has, who has been able to take us from from the point of hopelessness to standing on the promises. And also looking at scripture and showing that really here's God and he has a consistent message that has gone through 66 books. It has gone through what, 40 authors? 1500 years. 1,500 years. Okay, so what I want to do then to begin with is take a look at um, just what the Jews were uh, in this, this context. They had been in exile for 70 years. When we look at the Chronicles, they're coming back. They're coming back from their exile. 70 years in Babylon. Now, they're only dealing with the southern tribes. For those who are not familiar with it, the... Uh, the kingdom was divided after King Solomon. And so you had the northern tribes, which were ten, and then you had the southern tribes, which were two. And so the northern tribes had been in exile and scattered. There was a prophecy by Jeremiah that says that the tribe of Judah would go into exile for 70 years. And so they've been off in exile in Babylon. What they leave behind is complete, utter devastation. The walls of Jerusalem, the city of God, were about knee high. The tabernacle, the temple, actually the temple, was destroyed. Their identity, which was to be with God in the temple, was gone. Their city, which was supposed to be uh, an example to the nations around, was destroyed. They had nothing. 
For 70 years, the people had been in exile, and their kids had now been taught Aramaic, Babylonian gods, Babylonian way of life. They're coming back to a nation that, uh, their country, which had been destroyed. The nation had no identity, and furthermore, they didn't have a temple. And this is, uh, during this time is where the synagogue, the synagogue comes into dominance. The synagogue provided a place for them to worship, and it provided them a place of, of instruction. And this was in Babylon. So they, they weren't completely void. They had been taught. Many of the people who had gone into Babylon would never return. You think of, of Daniel, Daniel, Meshach, and Abednego. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They would not return. They would stay there. There were a few who would come back that went into exile as very young, and they would come back. But for the most part, those who came back were really didn't know. Who am I? What, 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 is, what does it mean to be God's people? So you're going to have three uh, occasions where Jews are going to return. Uh, in uh, October 539 BC, C Cyrus overthrows Babylon, and a year later in 538, he decrees that the Jews should return. This is part of how he was uh, the uh, Persian Empire was set up. And so in 538, Zerubbabel is going to go ahead and lead the first of the Jews back. 538. He leads about 50,000 Jews back into Jerusalem. When they get there, what do they see? They see their, their city, Jerusalem, which has got walls that are deep high. They have uh, a temple that has been completely destroyed. And this is where they're going to start. I'm pretty sure life was pretty comfortable in Babylon. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so what did they start out to do is they first start off in about 536 B.C. to rebuild their temple. They're going to start off and say, well, let's, let's go ahead and start with our temple. And we're going to build that. So they start off building their temple in about 536. Um, if you want to read more about it, you can read in uh, Ezra how the, the people around it started to go, mm, no, that's not a good idea. And they start causing problems. And they send letters back to uh, Cyrus and they say, uh, you really need to take a look at these people's history. They're rebellious, they're stiff-necked. And uh, they have a history of not doing what you say. The temple construction is now going to be halted for 15 years. It's going to be halted for 15 years while this all gets worked out. Meanwhile, the people are there. They're living. They're trying to reestablish themselves. A little bit lost. Darius affirms the decree of Cyrus in 521. So 15 years later, he affirms the decree. And in 516, they go ahead and they finish the temple. 516 B.C., they finished the temple. If you look it up, it's 70 years from the time the temple's destroyed to the time they built it. 70 years. As was prophesied by uh, Prophet Jeremiah. In about 458, Ezra is going to return. Now he's going to return, and Ezra's a priest, and he's going to return with the purpose of helping these people reestablish themselves as to who they are in Christ or in the Lord. So he, he leads them back. He is looking to build a, a, a true spiritual uh, foundation for the people. Remember, they don't speak Hebrew. They speak Aramaic. They've been taught in the synagogue, but they, they don't know what to do with this temple. They're a little bit at a loss. So he comes back, and he is going to reestablish a spiritual foundation for the people. 
And we have a temple, but the city is still pretty much in ruins. And in um, 444 BC, Nehemiah is going to come back. And Nehemiah, he, he, gets, a, he gets the credit for rebuilding the, the walls of Jerusalem in less than two months. In spite of all the opposition. And Nehemiah is going to be there for 12 years. And what his purpose is, not only to re rebuild the Jerusalem walls, but was also to go ahead and preach a national repentance. People are still a little bit lost. It is during this time that Ezra and Nehemiah are there that they're going to go ahead and they're going to write their books. Uh, who else is there that's, that would be even related to the Jews is going to be the Samaritans, if those who are um, familiar at all. Samaritans were the northern tribes that when they, uh, Syria took them into exile, what they did is the, uh, the Assyrians would bring their own people in and they would settle the land. And then they would intermarry with the Jews that remained there. That, was, that is all of what they were, they were intending to do, uh, was essentially uh, water down the people that were there. Uh, so you, this is where the, the tension comes between Samaritans and Jews, because Samaritans were not, well, they're not really true Jews. They're a half Jew, half something else. So that's where this all comes in. This is, this is somewhat of the historical setting for what is going on at this time in Chronicles. And it kind of is, is one of those things where we look at it and we go, okay, um, what, what did, why did they write these books? So, uh, if we took a look at the Jewish Old Testament, we would see that Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles are written in the 450, 425 BC. That's the time frame in which they were written. Now, in Luke 24, 44, you remember that Jesus uh, talks about the fact that um, he says, well, uh, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Uh, let, me, let me look this up real quick for you. Uh, Luke 24, 44, it says this. He, that's Jesus, said to them, This is what I told you while I was, with, I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and Psalms. The three divisions of the book. Pardon? That is Luke 24-44. In the uh, Jewish Bible, the Old Testament, it would have those three divisions. You would have the, the Torah, the law. You would go ahead and have the prophets, and this would include all the minor prophets, major prophets, would all be in there. And then you would have the writings, and the writings would be the Psalms, the Proverbs, Job, uh, Song of Solomon, uh, Song of Songs, Ruth, Lamentations, Ecclesiastes, Esther, Daniel, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Chronicles. Chronicles is actually the last book in the Jewish Old Testament. So what we're looking at when we go to the book of Chronicles is going to be essentially the fact that this is the last book. There is only one book that is written after Chronicles, and that would be Malachi. Malachi was written at approximately, uh, I believe it was like 400, 450 to 400 BC. So after uh, about 20, possibly 25 years after uh, Ezra and Nehemiah wrote their books. Now, interesting enough is the early on the. Uh, these four books were really considered one. They were considered one book. And uh, it wasn't until about 180 BC that Chronicles was actually divided into two books. About 180 BC. That they actually divided it into the two books. Okay, so this is, these are the books that are going to be written, and they're going to be written specifically to the Chronicle 
what has transpired during this time, during the rebuilding or, or right after the rebuilding of the temple and the rebuilding of the wall of Jerusalem by Nehemiah. And if you're ever wondering about what these books are about, um, Ezra, I kind of remember, but Nehemiah, I always remember as the walls being knee high. Mm -hmm. Knee high Maya. That's, that's the way I always remember what, what, what's in Nehemiah. Uh, but Chronicles, um, Chronicles was interesting from, from a standpoint I'm going to show you in a minute. Um, its author is Ezra, and its audience is the post exilic Jews, the ones who had to come back from Babylon. They've, they've started to settle in the land. They have to pay tribute back to Babylon. They uh, are trying to put their, their nationality back together. They're trying to walk according to how God wants them to walk. So when Ezra wrote this book, he comes down and says, all right, and not I said, but we look at it and say, um, I said, I want to review why Judah went into captivity. You know, it's always a good thing to remember why you got into a situation so you don't repeat it. I don't know about you, but it kind of helps me. <clears throat> I'm sitting there sometimes going, okay, hey, now, why is it that I don't have um, any money left in the bank? Oh, yeah, I spent it on, you know. <laughs> or uh, um, in my job is kind of like, okay, um, how come we don't have enough parts to fix our equipment? Oh, yeah, I didn't figure it out in the beginning correctly. Uh, but anyway, here it was to just review why they went into captivity. And uh, it's also going to provide them some hope, a sense of identity, and direction. So this, when you look at this, it's really uh, similar in some ways as to what we see in Acts with the disciples who were scattered. Jesus has brought them back together. And now he says, no, you need to stay here in Jerusalem. And uh, I'm going to send somebody. I'm going to send the Holy Spirit. And he wants you to stay here. And uh, these Jews were back for several decades, sitting there going like, what do we do, God? Um, we've got a temple, but how do we use it? Um, who are you? Who am I? What's our hope? What's our future? And so Ezra wants to address this problem with the Jews. All right, with that background, what I'd like to do is start looking at Chronicles, specifically 1 Chronicles and 2 Chronicles. If you were to take your Bible and look at it and read it, you would find out that 1 Chronicles is a, re a repeat of 1 and 2 Samuel, dealing with the reign of King David. So Ezra writes down, sits down, and he's going to write sort of like a Cliff Notes version, if you would, of everything about the reign of King David. Now, I know we know many things about King David, and, and uh, we know several things about his not-so-good choices with Bathsheba. Uh, Ezra doesn't dwell on a lot of that. He's going to hit some points, because he, he's got a purpose he has a purpose in writing this, and that is, is he wants the people to know uh, who they are and the fact that God hasn't forgotten. So you have a hope, you have a future. In big strokes, we can take a look at this, and it starts off with the genealogy. Uh, chapters 1 to 9 are going to be a genealogy, and it's going to go from Adam all the way to David. And within that genealogy is uh, some interesting things that how it's structured, focusing primarily on the Levitical tribe. Uh, starting with chapter 10, then, you're going to look at the fact that it deals with David's anointing as the king. And then it's going to get into his reign. His reign as the king of all of Israel both the northern and southern tribes at that point. It's going to end with David's death and his accession of Solomon as the king. So that's where it's going to leave off. Now, if you were to lead, read all of 1 and 2 Samuel, there's a lot in there. Uh, but like I said, this is sort of the cliff notes version, a very shortened version of it. 
Then we get to 2 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles is going to be a repeat of 1 and 2 Kings. And in this, you're going to spend nine chapters with King Solomon, and then you're going to spend the remaining 26 chapters with the other kings of Judah. Northern tribes are not covered. The northern tribes are not covered. And the reason was is that the northern tribes, when they went into exile or they went into captivity, they were dispersed. It was only the southern tribes that were going to go ahead and have the prophecy of returning. So they don't, and in 2 Chronicles, Ezra does not deal with any of the northern tribes. You will find that if you go through this, there's two key terms are used, though. Um, the first term is the fact that says, here is your, how the king followed the Lord, and here's what they did in forsaking the Lord. So if you go through, and if you were to read it, or when you read it, you'll see the term, uh, he did which was pleasing to the Lord, and then you'll find that he forsook the Lord. And sometimes the king forsook the Lord, and then he followed the Lord later on. Some kings started off really, really well and ended really poor. Others, they started off on the wrong foot and God got their attention as they were kings. Okay, so this, this repetition is going to stress the importance of your, who you are as, as a Jew. Going to stress the importance of that. That's why that repetition is going to be there. Okay, so that's the books as themselves. Uh, what we want to take a look at is just basically looking at this genealogy. I want to I'm going to narrow in and focus in on, on the genealogy. Uh, if you went back to your home in Montecito up here, and all you saw was a barren lot with some bricks sticking up and maybe a fireplace, <clears throat> what would be the first thing you would think about? Yeah, with all the pictures you lost, you know, all your identity papers. Uh, can you prove that this land is, belongs to you? Where, where are those papers? All that's gone. So the genealogy was there, was placed there, partly to help them say, here is who you are. It's going to go from Adam all the way to King David. And said, here's who you are. It was also going to be required that you show who you are by lineage if you were going to go ahead and have any land. If, when the Jews went in to the promised land, they said, okay, um, Judah, you get this land. Simeon, you get this land. Uh, this car, you get this land. God, you get this land. This is yours. Well, in this case, it was Judah and Benjamin. Here is your land. Here is your land. And you had to be able to go in and say, all right, um, uh, Here's my papers that show who I am. And based upon these papers, that means that I get some land over here. This would belong to me. If you didn't have these papers and you couldn't go into the temple and say, okay, here's the record, then you were left with nothing. You could own a house in town. But you couldn't own any property, anything around. That, that wasn't yours. Because you couldn't prove who you were. You could not prove your lineage. Now, when, when we look at genealogies, we, most of the time we just skip through them. Right? I, I mean, let's be fair. So-and-so we got, so-and-so we got, so-and-so. Mm, okay, moving on. That's how we read them. But to the Jews, they were everything. And what always comes to my mind is the fact that, as a believer, if my name is not recorded, I'm not going to have a place. The 
the book of life. If your name is not written in the book of life, where is your place in heaven, in eternity? Not there. So just like the Jews had to have their name and proof in order to own property, so we as believers, our name must be written in the book of life if we're going to have that place that God has prepared for us. Now this godly line that we're looking at in here is also going to be repeated when we go into um, uh, into Luke. Okay, so when we take a look at this, what it is is it starts off and does the non-tribe past from Adam. And then it goes in, and it's really going to center in on the tribe of Levi. So it, it spends a, a great deal of time on, the, on Levi, and uh, the other tribes, not so much. And what it does, it brings them all the way up to the post exilic community, those Jews who have returned. And that's where it ends. So in these what, nine chapters, it does that. All right. Now, uh, Jasmine, I, I told you this scripture. Uh, did you read it? Yeah, right, okay. First and foremost. <laughs> Let's take a look at this. If you have your Bible, I want you to take a look and read this. Uh, turn to First Chronicles. One minute. Those who don't know where First Chronicles is, it's the after the kings. And it's going to go ahead and be um, two books. All right. Don't have your Bible, here's what it says. Adam, Sheph, Enosh, Canaan, Mahalali, Jared, Hanak, Methuselah, Lamech, Noah, Shem, Ham, Jacob. I think I got some misspellings in there. Thank you from Microsoft for uh, <laughs> correcting some of those names. <laughs> Mahalo's uh, misspelled and Enoch is misspelled there. So names. I just noticed that. Oh well. All right. That is the, that 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 is primarily my, my main text. Now, I, I've got to ask: How many have ever had a sermon on a genealogy? This one, yes. <laughs> I've heard one in my life. One. Just one. It's the Bible. But it's the Bible. And so when I'm looking at this, I'm going, why did Ezra write this? <clears throat> there had to be a reason he wrote this. Because after in verse 5 it says, the son of Japheth were Gomer, Mangog, Madai, Javon. And it goes into what I understand is more of a traditional genealogy. And years, several years ago, I, I came across this and I, I just scratched my head and I went, okay, what's going on? And this is when, it's probably been about seven years ago, I researched this. It's these names and the fact that we will go ahead and look at 1 Chronicles 17, 11 to 14. So if we take a look at 1 Chronicles 17, 11 to 14. <coughs> it says this. When your days are fulfilled, and this is talking to King David, when your days are fulfilled, that you must go to be with your fathers, that I will, I being the Lord God, will set up one of your descendants after you, who will be your sons, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build for me a house, and I will establish his throne forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. And I will not take my loving kindness away from him as I took it from him who was before you. 
but I will settle with him in my house and in my kingdom forever. And his throne shall be established forever. Okay, we're in church. Who's this talking about? Jesus. Talking about Jesus. It says, David, you're going to go, you're going to die, but there's someone, a son that's coming after you. And I'm going to establish my kingdom. The apostles, they would have known about some of these prophecies. This is just one of many. And so when they're asking, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus says, uh, just hold on, not, not yet. Not yet. It, it's... it's it's coming, but it's, it's not for you right now. It's not for you to know, but wait. Just wait. So when we look at this, and this, this scripture is actually taken from 2 Samuel 7, 12 to 16, same verse. When we look at that, and, and uh, the, there were, uh, we, we can say simply the fact that it's the future to us. When the Lord returns and sets up his kingdom, it's future to us. It's the promise of the kingdom. In 1 Chronicles 17, we have the promise of the kingdom. And it is a promise that we can go ahead and hold on to today. What I want to do then is also look at that promise and the fact that you have a uh, you have to put your faith in that promise. So taking a look at these names, which are going to be in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 1 to 4. Now, when I start this, what I want you to understand is that names to the Jews have meaning. Jews have, the, the names have meaning. So if you were to go ahead and look at something like uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel ends in E-L, right? Let me spell it. And Daniel, the E-L, was the name of God. And it simply meant, if you were to look at it, Daniel meant, God is my judge. <clears throat> if you were to take a look at Nathaniel, which also ends in E-L, it stands for gift of God. Um, Gabriel means man of God or God's able-bodied one. That's what it means. Now, you could also end up with a name like Jabez. Anybody heard of the prayer of Jabez? Okay. I think a lot of it. There's a book that was written and became very famous. I've never written it. I've never wrote it. Excuse me. I never read it. No, I didn't write it, that's for sure. <laughs> but if you were to take a look at 1 Chronicles 4, 9 and 10, it says this, Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother named him Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. <laughs> so I don't know about you, but if, you, if you're going to go around and say, hey, um, how are you doing there, Jabez, one who was born in pain? <laughs> and now there's some other comical ones within it too, and uh, it's quite often they, they change they change their names. Sometimes uh, the father does. Jacob did that when it came to Benjamin. He changed Benjamin's name, uh, his son. But these names actually are going to have some meaning. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to actually go all the way back and look. If you want to go all the way back to uh, Genesis chapter five where we'll see these names actually are taken from. All right, let's first off, let's deal with Adam. And, and uh, if you want to find all of where I got this from, you can take a look at Genesis chapter 5. Uh, you can follow along there if you like. And I did the reading, um, the research on this using some other uh, dictionaries and some Greek, uh, Hebrew, not Greek, but some Hebrew um, dictionaries and things. Uh, what we know about Adam was he was the first man, right? He was number one. And his name simply meant man. 
This simply means man. We know that he lived to be 930 years from our text that's in Genesis chapter 5, uh, verses 3 to 5. So verse 5 says, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. Mr. Cortez, how many years you got left to make that important? <laughs> But don't worry, uh, our life is much shorter than it was then. Uh, you have between Adam all the way to the time of the flood, which is in, in 1 Chronicles chapter 1, verses 1 to 4, it ends up with Noah, you have, there's 1,656 years. So from the time that Adam dies all the way to the flood, you're going to have about another 726 years. 726 years. Okay, from there, we're going to have, Seth is going to be born to him when he's 130. 130 years old, Seth is going to be born. And if you take a look at this, it says, when Adam had lived, this is verse 3, when Adam had lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his own likeness, according to his image, and he named him Seth. But Seth, actually, you get the name, the meaning of it from chapter 4, verse 25, uh, where it talks about his birth. And Eve said, God has appointed me an offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. So when you look at it, Seth simply means appointed. He's appointed. Now, Seth is going to live 912 years. So he's only dying 18 years after his father does. Still a long time. Then there's Enosh. And Enosh, in verse 9, uh, actually up there in verse 7, Six. Seth lived 105 years and became the father of Enosh. So at 105, Enosh is born, and he's going to live 905 years, dying only a few years after his father as well. Now, Enosh uh, has the, comes from a root called mortal. It comes, the root word means mortal or frail or miserable. So, I don't know about you, but I'm not sure I want to go around with a name that says miserable. Something about that to go like, hey, how you doing today, miserable? You here to make my name, my name miserable? Uh, a lot of ways you can go with that. Uh, so, he, he goes ahead. He's going to um, uh, live for 905 years and... It's in these days that, of Enosh that man began to defile the name of the living God. So we're only 235 years. 235 years and, and, and men are now defiling the name of the living God. That's the same one that says... They began to call upon the name of the Lord? That's what it means? Is it mean that they began to call upon the name of the Lord? That's the same verse that, that, that would say that they're defining the name of the Lord. Uh, we find that from um, other places if, if we go after the uh, chapter 5. Uh, you would you kind of have to do a little bit of work, but you'd find that in that time frame that they begin to defile the name of the Lord at that point. So if you look at uh, chapter 6, essentially, you would find that within chapter 6 that uh, man's heart becomes, you know, basically more and more wicked. And uh, we actually don't get to the flood until you, you start dealing with chapter 7 and, uh, and Noah. So, like I said, this is like, like one little quick notes in Chronicle that this text is, is in this here. 
All right, so this is Enosh. And then after Enosh, you're going to have a gentleman by the name of Kenneth. Now, he's going to be born at, uh, when Enosh is 90 years old, he's going to live to be 910 years old. Canon means sorrow, dirge, eulogy. Mm -hmm. uh, we've actually kind of lost the actual uh, pronunciation of this. It's somewhat elusive. Um, some claim that it's an Aramaic word. Uh, but it's interesting, if you were to go to Numbers chapter 24, it is Bala, when he, you know, he's supposed to call out this curse on Jerusalem, on the Jews. Uh, but he stands over Moab, uh, the heights of Moab, and he uses the term Canaanite as a pun. I had to look this up. I said, really? Yeah, he did. He says, this is, this is what, what he said. Uh, he looks out, he says, then he looked on the Canaanites. And he took up this oracle and said, Firm is your dwelling place, and your nest is set in the rocks. Oh, here, let me say dirge for you. The accent was a curse. It's kind of a pun. Pun, yeah. Really, the Canaanites. Uh, he lives 910 years, and then he dies. Following this, you're going to have Mahalo. And Mahalo is one of those that... Um, He's born in Canada, 70 years old, and it comes from essentially the two, two words. Uh, Mahala, which means blessed or praise, and Al, which means the name of God. So his name means blessed of God, or the blessed God. That's what his name means. So we have a couple, like, you know, depressing, yeah, let's, let's a little bit better. He's going to live 895 years. After this, we're going to have Jared. And Jared is one of those that's born when uh, Mahal is uh, 65 years old. He's going to live 962 years. His name comes from the uh, verb called Yarda, and it means shall come down. Shall come down. Uh, it is, uh, it's believed in some circles that this may have uh, some allusion to the fact of Genesis 6-3, where it says that uh, the Lord said, My spirit shall not abide with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his day shall be 120 years. And so there's this thing of the sons of God coming down, uh, referring to the fallen ones, because God's striving with them. And... Uh, the, this resulted in this uh, uh, Nephilims. Nephilims. I, I think I pronounced that right. Nephilims. Uh, which were uh, supposed to be a combination. Now, there's some, dis there's some disputes on what that all means. But uh, it does mean the fact that uh, shall come down. That's what it means. Okay, from here we get into Enoch. Now, Enoch is one of those that... Um, is a rather interesting individual. Uh, he's born when Jared's 162 uh, years old, and he lives a very short life, 365. Well, actually, he doesn't die. Right? And for those who know the Old Testament, he doesn't die because he's taken up. But here's what's interesting. When Enoch is 65 years old, something interesting happens to him. Something interesting happens to him. We're supposed to see him as rational. Yeah, you know, that's a great question, and, and uh, we'll see him. The, you know, the, some say Enoch, because he didn't die, will be one of the two prophets in Jerusalem. Well, we don't know that, but that's what some would hold to. When Enoch is 65 years old, he, ends, he comes into a, uh, a prophecy. comes into a prophecy. And his name means teaching or commencement. Mm -hmm. And if you were to take a look at the book of Jude, now if you want to jump all the way to the book of Jude, which is just before Revelation. Mm 
Enoch is given a prophecy. And this prophecy is written in the book of Enoch, which we don't have copies today, but Jude the Apostle did write about it in his book. So if you take a look at Jude, verses 14 and 15, it says, It was also about these men that Enoch, in the seventh generation from Adam, prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of his holy ones to execute judgment upon all, and to convict all the ungodly of their ungodly deeds, which they have done in an ungodly way, and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So something happened. We know Enoch walked with God. He walked with God. But he's get this, he has this prophecy that, that he has, and it's, it is from Enoch that we learn, or he will learn, that the flood of Noah would be coming. So really, from the time of Enoch up until 1656, or 1656, uh, 1,656 years after Adam was, uh, we have a record of Adam, we have this prophecy to the end. The flood didn't come as a surprise. In fact, and when he's 65, he's going to have a son named Methuselah. The oldest man in the Bible. The he lives 969 years. Yeah. Going for the young here, Mr. Kroger? 969 years. Methuselah uh, comes from two roots. And there, there's some dispute on this, but if we take a look at Jude, I think Jude is, it really helps clarify it. It comes from moth, and it, that means death. And shalak, which means to bring or to send forth. So his name means or signifies death shall bring. And it is in the year of the flood that Methuselah dies. So Methuselah for 969 years is living prophecy of the fact of the judgment that's coming. 969 years. His life, in effect, was a symbol of God's mercy. Methuselah's life. Methuselah's life, living the longest, 969 years, and it is, is an example of God's mercy. He says, I'm patient with you. For the next 969 years, everybody that knew possibly about this Methuselah, when he dies, there's something that's going to happen, which is a flood. Uh, he gets the flu. Uh, Methuselah, are you okay? Make people just a little bit weary. 969 years. So he's going to die in the year of the flood. And from here, you're going to have a gentleman by the name of Lemek is going to be born when Methuselah is 187 years Methuselah is 187 years old. Interesting to note, when Lemek is 56 years old, Adam dies. 56 years old, Adam dies. Lemek, if you think about lament, this is where we get the term lament from Lemek. And that simply means despair. It means despair. Now, at this point, I want you to realize that Adam and Eve have had other sons and daughters. Now, we don't know to what time that they stopped having kids. But let's just say 800 years. <laughs> 700 years. 
let's say it's 700 years and they're living to be 900 years old. That means that the sons and daughters of Adam are approaching the flood. One of the questions I do want to ask Adam when I see him. So, uh, boys, girls, what's the count? <laughs> but man's wickedness had grown by this time. Man's wickedness had grown quite significant. Those were his kids, though. That's right, they were his kids. Lamech is going to have Noah when he's 182 years old. And Noah is, well, he's born 126, after, 126 years after Adam dies. Uh, his name, Nachum or Nachum, means to bring relief, rest, or comfort. And we get that from Genesis chapter 5, verse 29, if you take a look at that. 5.29, it simply says, this one, will, this one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Mm -hmm. Be a little plan again? Mm-hmm. Six hundred years into his life, the flood comes. The flood comes. Uh, we do know that uh, Noah had three kids, three boys at least, and um, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Oh, actually, it's Japheth is the young, the oldest. Shem is the uh, middle boy, and then Ham is the youngest. And they're born between when Noah's about 500, 540 years old. Now, we don't have any other record if he had other kids before then. Uh, it is during, uh, it's 120 years, of, of the Lord says, uh, I'm done. Uh, you've got 120 years, and I'm going to wipe everybody out. Uh, I'll wipe everybody out. But it's also, when we look at it, it was uh, about 55 to 75 years someplace in there where actually the Lord said, but I will establish my covenant with you and you shall become, you shall come into an ark. So we actually have a prophecy about the ark when uh, it takes them about 55 to 75 years, someplace in there, to go ahead and build, build the ark. All right, so this is our genealogy that is in First Chronicles. Going back to Genesis chapter five, and kind of when you put it on a chart like this, you kind of see, wow, you know, um, Adam dies during the time of Lemek, which is not long before the flood, as their time goes. What's interesting, if we take these names and we will put out, uh, put them down like this, and we go back and we take a look at their names, it would read like this. Man appointed mortal sorrow, mortal sorrow, the blessed God shall come down teaching his death shall bring the despairing rest for yeah, us. Pardon? We have this the if you want, yeah. So what you see here is Adam sins, he's given a prophecy, uh, Eve is a fact about, you know, Satan. It says, who we'll bruise your head, you shall crush your head. Uh, you should bruise his heel and he will crush your head. And then for the next 1,656 years, this prophecy is lived out in these names. The fact that we have in the first four verses in Chronicles, which seem to be an arbitrary name, is the fact that says, let me tell you about who your God is. In the name. They're in the name. So, read the genealogies like they're the Bible. It changed the way I read genealogies. Yeah. Because even when I go into uh, Matthew and Luke, I find things in the genealogies that most people just go, mm -hmm. we just go over it. Yeah. I found a lot of fascinating things in genealogies. Mm -hmm. The way they're structured, who they bring out, who they skip. Mm -hmm. But the fact that this is here, and then you go ahead and you take a look at, 
you take a look at Chronicles, 1 Chronicles chapter 17, and what is he saying in 1 Chronicles chapter 17? Let me tell you that there is someone who's coming whose throne is going to be established forever. The book of Chronicles is simply saying, you the Jews have come back from captivity and now here is who you are. You are in this godly lineage. You have a hope and a future because God hasn't forgotten you. He has a promise. He has a promise. There's a kingdom coming that's going to have no end. And so when the apostles are sitting there with Jesus and going, now, now, are you going to do it now? Jesus is saying, wait, 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 just hold on. Hold on. Not yet. Not yet. If I have a God that can take almost two millennium and, and bring this out, that's my God. That's my God. That also makes me, when I look at these names and when they live, realize that God put me here at this time for a reason. As well as everybody else. I've met several people in all my travels. Uh, I met one individual one time who had five given names. Five. And on a break one time, I had to ask him, why five? He says, my dad wanted me to remember from where I came. Yeah. So it was his father, his grandfather, his great-grandfather, and back. He says, I want you to know who you are. I want you to know who you are. Fifteen hundred years, forty authors, sixty-six books, one message. The prophecy of Jesus starts with Adam and goes for the next one thousand six hundred fifty-six years. The promise of an eternal kingdom, which was prophesied back in Chronicles, something you look forward to today. And finally, God chose us, means you and me, for this period, for this place, for a reason. Now, we don't go by names, meaning of names too much in our country. That's not something we do. But it's how we live. It's how we live. In a Bible study this last week, and uh, we were in Deuteronomy, and we were going over these sundry laws, and they were chuckling over them. It's like, literally, how do you go to the bathroom around here? You go outside the camp, you dig a hole. That's where you go. You don't do it in the town, you don't do it in the camp, because the Lord is going to walk around here. And they're going, I don't get these laws. And I said, it's simple. How I live is a witness to the people around me. Today. Any questions? Let's close in prayer. Father, I just want to thank you for your word. It's living, it's active. Sharper than any two-edged sword. You are through the whole Bible. Your message of salvation. Your plan for us to be a people that is to be a witness. To do good works. Father, well, you don't need our good works, but our people around us sure do. And they need to know you. God, may we live in a way that is pleasing to you and a witness to the people around us. 